Daniel chapter 2, from verse 28 to verse 49. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been, been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the other living, but in order that the interpretation might be made known to the king and that, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, and its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you'd looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You are king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of men, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix not with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. And King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and paid homage to Daniel. And he commanded that an offering of incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honours and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. We trust that God will bless his perfect word to our hearts this evening. Well, as we continue our study in the book of Daniel, we've come to one of the most important sections in the entire book. We're stepping into what would have been an amazingly intense situation for Daniel and his friends. As they stand before the king of Babylon, it is a matter of life and death. So let me just remind you of how we got here, what we saw in the passage last week. You might remember Nebuchadnezzar's been having bad dreams It's only the second year of his reign and the wheels are already beginning to come off. He's having bad dreams, he's not sleeping. And it's not just that he's stressed or overworked. The God of heaven has been sending him these bad dreams. He is anxious and he is afraid. 
And it's, it's not long before the anxiety and fear turns into rage and malice. He demands that the wise men, the enchanters, um, tell him what the dream means. Tell him what the dream means and its interpretation. But no one has been able to help him. So when he sees that no one can help him, he gets furious and he decides that he's going to rip the limbs off the wise men of Babylon and turn their houses to a heap of ash. He issues a decree that they all be destroyed, including Daniel and his friends. Now, it would have been terrifying news to hear that King Nebuchadnezzar was coming for you. He didn't mess around. But what did they do? We saw last week, instead of panicking, they prayed. Instead of worrying, they worshipped. And God revealed the mystery to them. He spoke to Daniel in a vision of the night, and he gave him both the dream and its interpretation. He is truly a God who reveals mysteries. Now, as we arrive in our passage, the moment has arrived. It's time to stand before the king and give him the vision. And now remember, if he's not accurate, if he doesn't tell the king the truth, he will have his limbs ripped off. And even if he is accurate, the king might still not be happy with this message. He might still decide to kill Daniel and his friends. It's an intense moment, but Daniel walks in there calm, cool, and collected. He walks into that place as a prophet. He walks in ready to give the king the word of the Lord. So this is where we find ourselves. We're gathered with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel in front of the king. Now, there are three questions I want to ask of this passage. And they're three good questions to ask of any passage. If you're preaching through a passage, these are three good questions to ask. At first, I want to ask the question, what do we see in this passage? What does it say? Secondly, I want to look at what does the passage mean? And thirdly, how should we respond in light of the truth of this passage. What does it say? What does it mean? And how should I respond? It's a great way to read your Bible. So let's look together first and then at what does the passage say? What are we looking at here in Daniel chapter 2? Well, as Daniel stands before the wicked king Nebuchadnezzar, he's already made it clear that what he's going to share is not his opinion, it is the word of God. Have a look with me in verse 28. Daniel tells, tells Nebuchadnezzar, There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So this is where Daniel's confidence comes from. It comes from the fact that he's delivering a message for God. He's passing on a divine edict which God has given to him. And he fears the God of heaven more than the king of Babylon. He's not going to pussyfoot around like the astrologers, the wise men, the Chaldeans. He's come to say, thus saith the Lord to the king. Now, before he gives the king the interpretation, he wants to give a disclaimer. He wants to tell the king that this wisdom didn't come from himself. It came from the true God. He wants to be humble before the king that he doesn't receive any of the glory for the message he's about to give. Have a look with me in verses 28 to 30. And Daniel says this as his introduction to the king. He says, Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in your bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that he may know the thoughts of his mind. He wants to be clear before he delivers this message, he's just the messenger. He's humble, just like John the Baptist was as we looked at on Sunday. Daniel was humble too. These are the people whom God uses to pass on his message. So with that as a brief introduction, Daniel comes before the king and he's going to tell him what he saw. Have a look with me in verse 31. He begins to explain the king's dream to him. He says, You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. Now, just stop there for a second, because there's an important principle, even in just this first verse. Um, if you're reading in ESV tonight, it will say, You saw, O king. 
but perhaps you're reading the New King James or the NIV, and it might say, you were watching, O King, which I think is a little bit clearer of what's going on. Now, why is Daniel reminding the king that he was watching? Why is he saying that right at the start of the vision? Well, we see right at the start, God's wanting to put Nebuchadnezzar in his rightful place. As he watches these events of history unfold before his eyes, Nebuchadnezzar is not in control. He's watching from the sidelines. He saw it happen. He had no control. He wasn't an important piece of the game. He was watching it happen. He was watching God's decree unfold. He's on the sidelines. He's not at the center. He's not in control. That's an important thing to see. That's what Daniel starts off with. Verse 31, you were watching, O king, and behold a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you and its appearance was frightening. Now, this is typical of prophetic imagery, isn't it? Prophetic pictures are big and bold and bright. They're oversized. They're over-exaggerated to help you get the meaning of what's been said. There's ten-headed dragons, locusts with the hair of women and the the teeth of men. They're pictures to show us a spiritual reality. Now, if you've been around church a while, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you will have probably seen a picture like this on the screen. Have you seen this guy before? We've all seen him, haven't we, if we've been Christians for a few years? This is perhaps something like the vision which Nebuchadnezzar So so let me just describe it to you and see if this picture gives us any indication if if it's anything like what the Bible says. It says, The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and its arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. These um, images are helpful, aren't they, which we've grown up with. We can't be sure that's exactly what it looked like. But it's a pretty good depiction. We know that's what Nebuchadnezzar's face looked like. You can see the wallpaper in the British Museum, Sennacherib's wallpaper. You can look at some of that stuff in, 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 in England. It's all there for you. That's what the Babylonian kings would have looked like. So he sees this big, gnarly statue, and he's afraid of it. It's intimidating. But I think deep down he knows that something's wrong. He knows that something is happening to his kingdom as he watches this unfold. Have a look with me at verse 34 as Daniel continues explaining the dream to him. So we've seen the statue, but look in verse 34 at what happens. And note again, Nebuchadnezzar's watching from the sidelines. Verse 34, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. So if you thought the vision was weird to begin with, with this big statue, it's just got a lot stranger, hasn't it? Suddenly this rock is cut out from somewhere, presumably a mountain, and it comes flying down towards the image, smashes it on the feet, and it comes down like a wrecking ball and destroys the statue. Have a look with me at verse 35 at the effects of this stone smashing the statue. It says, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So it's just got even stranger, hasn't it? Perhaps someone catapulted the stone, perhaps someone threw it at the statue and took it down. But then this stone grows and becomes a mountain. What's all that about? What is God trying to communicate to us? Well, if you're a little bit confused when you look at this big statue, you're not the only one. Nebuchadnezzar was confused too, wasn't he? He didn't have a clue what it meant. Its meaning was spiritual and therefore it had to be spiritually discerned. But thankfully for us tonight, thankfully for Nebuchadnezzar, there's a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, a God who speaks, and a God who has given us as his people here in Gisborne his infallible word. God has made known the mystery to us. He explains it in his word. 
It's not through a vision in the night, it's through the reading of his scriptures this evening. So we've seen briefly what the passage says, but what does it all mean? And this is where all the debates come in, isn't it? This is where we all have different views. We've seen together what does the passage say, but what does the passage mean? What does the passage mean? Well, I'm not sure about you guys here tonight, but for me personally, I really enjoy it when you read in the Bible and it gives you a vision and then it tells you what the vision means. It's really helpful, isn't it? The same when Jesus tells a parable and then he says, here's the meaning of the parable so we don't have to guess. But even in this passage, there's still some interpreting to be done. Even in the explanation, they're just signposts pointing us in the right direction. It doesn't mean we all come to the same conclusion, but God has left us some clues and signposts. Now, Daniel assured the king he wasn't worried about the interpretation. He didn't have any difficulties like we do. He tells the king, verse 36, this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar had a right to be worried, didn't he? His anxiety wasn't misplaced because this vision is about him. It's about his crumbling kingdom. And so Daniel wants to, he still doesn't want to get thrown in the fire. He's still using gracious language towards the king. But he's going to reveal to him that he's the head of gold who gets smashed on the floor. Have a look with me at verse 37 to 38. He says these words, You are king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory, into whose hand is given everyone who dwells on the face of the earth, the birds of the heavens. He's given you everything. And you see there, Daniel's almost just trying to soften the blow, isn't it? He's trying to soften the blow a little bit. But he says, you are the head of gold. You are the head of gold which gets smashed into the ground and destroyed. Now, Nebuchadnezzar and his pride as he hears this, he seems to enjoy this part of the vision. He thinks, I'm the head of gold, I must be so important. In fact, in the next few chapters, he's going to make an image of gold, isn't he? He's completely missing the message altogether. This isn't good, good news, but in his pride, he's stoked. I'm made of gold, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, this awesome king. So I bet he liked that part of the vision when he heard that he was the head of gold. But there's a subtle rebuke in Daniel's words, isn't there? Daniel's reminding him that all the blessings he's enjoyed have come from the God of heaven. Nebuchadnezzar will later say, is this not Babylon which my hand has created? But Daniel subtly reminded him, everything you have has been a gift from God. He has given you power and dominion. He has made you rulers over the kingdom of men and yet you do not acknowledge him. It's all good to be the head of gold until you realize it gets smashed to the ground by the rock cut without human hands. So that's the first thing he wants him to see. Nebuchadnezzar's the head of gold. He's the head over the nations. But another nation is going to come and dispossess him. Verse 39, look at these words. It says, another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And, and this is what is, is symbolized there by the, um, the chest of silver. And of course, we know from the history books, we know from the Bible itself that he's talking about the Persian Empire. After Nebuchadnezzar, his, his kingdom is going to fall in Babylon chapter, in um, Daniel chapter 5. And um, Cyrus the Great is going to come and, and, and put a, a Babylon to forced labor. He's going to overthrow the kingdom of Babylon. Just as God said he would hundreds of years before in the book of Isaiah. Listen to this prediction. Hundreds of years before Cyrus was even alive. It says, see, I will stir up against them. Speaking of Babylon, I will stir up against them the Medes. And they don't care for silver. They have no delight in gold. Their bows will strike down the young men. And they will have no mercy on infants. Nor will they look with compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, in the book of Isaiah, he even tells us the man's name, doesn't he? He says, Cyrus, my servant. 
God even knew his name. He says, you're going down, your kingdom's weighed in the balance and found wanting. And I'll even tell you the name of the guy who doesn't exist yet, who's going to do it. And that's how in control God is of human history. So the Babylonian Empire gives away to the Persian Empire. But history has a way of repeating itself, doesn't it? Eventually the Persian Empire falls and the Greece, kingdom of Greece comes to fruition. Now, of course, the kingdom of Greece was led by Alexander the Great. And he's said to have, have broken down and, and uh, wept in his 20s because there were no more kingdoms left to conquer. And that's what God said, isn't it? He said, this is the kingdom that shall rule over the whole earth. If you thought Babylon and Persia were powerful, Greece was even more powerful. He wept because there were no more lands to conquer. And yet there's still one more kingdom after this. Look with me in verse 40. And I do say just one more kingdom. I don't think the clay and the iron represents another kingdom. It says there shall be a fourth kingdom, not a fourth and a fifth, a fourth kingdom. Strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these kingdoms. And eventually, even the great Greek superpower gives way to the Roman Empire. And it was said of the Romans, they turned the cities into to deserts. They were like a strong iron force. You couldn't beat the Romans in open country. You couldn't beat their forces. They dashed people to pieces. They crucified them. They hacked them to bits. They were like legs of iron. They slaughtered thousands and thousands of women, men, and children. And they threshed the land like a, a wheat presser, fresh as wheat. And though it looked like Rome would last forever, though it looked like no one would ever conquer the Roman Empire, even within its walls there was um, dissension, there was um, schisms, there were people against each other, there were uh, governors who were assassinated by their own people. It had all this mixture within the empire. And this is what you see in the toes with the clay and the iron all mingled together. The kingdom of Rome looked solid as, but there was a, a dissension within the ranks. Look, look in verse 41. As you saw the feet of toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. It says they won't mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. It was a mixed and broken kingdom at the root. This is where we get the saying, feet of clay from. You say, your pastor's got feet of clay, he's just a man. Well, this is where that image comes from, the feet of clay. The Roman Empire looked like it was divinely sent. It looked like it was divinely sent to destroy everything. But it has feet with clay, and it will eventually fall. So these were the four human kingdoms which, which, which Daniel saw in the vision, which Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. But the most important thing of all in this whole image is the rock cut without human hands. Listen to the interpretation Daniel gives in verse 44. And it's significant, isn't it? It says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. In the days of those kings. It's not some far off future event at the end of time where it's the European Union, you know, the beast who sits on 10 hills, any of that sort of thing. It's in the days of those kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. So here you have this image of this man here, this, this hideous creature. But alongside him is the kingdom of God. It was the kingdom of God which brought death to Babylon, to Persia, to Greece, and to the Roman Empire. And that kingdom in the days of Rome became more visible than ever before as the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Word became flesh, stepped down from heaven to earth. 
That was the rock coming down to this world. He was cut without human hands. He wasn't, he wasn't created. He wasn't made. He was eternally begotten from the Father. He wasn't born of the man and the woman, but just the seed of the woman. It was a perfect conception um, sent by the Holy Spirit. It, so this is who it's talking about. It's talking about Christ, the one who was cut without human hands. He's been at work throughout history, but it becomes visible as he, as he steps down into our world. And that visibility just grows and grows and grows, doesn't it? As he comes in the baby in Bethlehem, he doesn't look like the one born to rule over the Jews. But as he grows up, as he steps into his ministry, as he preaches repentance, as he preaches the gospel, as he heals the sick, as he drives out demons, as he dies on the cross and raises himself from the dead, he is seen to be the rock cut without human hands, the son of man, the exalted one. When he leads captivity captives, when he destroys the kingdoms of men, when he is exalted by his father, we see that all the kingdoms of men received a death blow. As you look at this whole incident, there's so much language which is from the book of Psalms. There's so much language about Jesus Christ ruling over the nations. You see, Daniel chapter 2 is not about some far off event in the future. It's about the first coming of Christ. You see, when Christ came to this world and he died and rose again, he ascended to his father. And his father said to him in Psalm 2, he said, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possessions. And what did he say? You will rule them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And that's what you see in the book of Daniel, isn't it? The son of man destroying the kingdoms of men and smashing them to pieces like pottery. When Christ ascended to his father, that was his coronation. Christ is already reigning as king now. It's this which the scripture points us to. There's also an allusion to Psalm number one here. When you hear of the kingdoms of this world becoming chaff and been driven away by the wind, it's the language of Psalm one. Psalm one tells us the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Psalm 1 and 2 are fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there's going to be a final inauguration when the kingdom's presented back to the Father. But it's already begun now. The kingdom of God is already among us. The little stone is becoming the great mountain. I mean, that'd be a strange image if it was the end of time, wouldn't it? It's not like a little stone which slowly becomes a great mountain. When the new Jerusalem comes, comes down, it's the finished product. It's not gradual. It's another evidence that we're talking about the time we live in. And this is how Jesus spoke of the kingdom, isn't it? In Matthew 13. He said, The kingdom of heaven's like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it's the smallest of all the seeds, yet when it grows... It is the largest of the garden plants so that the birds come and perch in its branches. And he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast that a woman took and hid in in the flower until it worked its way through all the dough. It starts off small, but it grows into a great, great mountain. This is the picture scripture gives us. Christ comes as the stone. He destroys the kingdoms of men. He's exalted to the Father's right hand. And he will keep building his kingdom until Christ returns. Until Jesus reigns visibly from sea to sea and the Lord's mountain becomes the highest of all mountains. Until all the bread is leavened, until the tree is the biggest tree in the garden. That is what God's plan is. This is the kingdom which cannot be shaken, the kingdom that cannot be passing away. Now, this is the teaching of many generations of Christians before us. And I would submit to you, this is the teaching of the Bible. The kingdom of, God's rece- uh, the kingdom of men sorry, has received the death blow. The kingdom of God is expanding. So we've looked at, the, at what the passage says. We've looked at what the passage means. Now let's look together at how should we live in, in light of these things. How should we live in light of these things? 
And as usual, the word of God is helpful even in this. It points us in the right direction. It shows us how we should respond to this good news of the kingdom of God. Have a look at Nebuchadnezzar's reaction, verse 46. It said, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel. And he commanded that an offering of incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. He falls on his face before God. Now, it, it seems that he falls before Daniel as well, doesn't it? And we don't want to fall before men. We don't want to give men the prayers. But his heart's been affected by the God of heaven. The, the knowledge that there's a true God that is in control of everything, it leads him to worship and to prayers. And I would suggest that our knowledge of God should do the same for us. Any knowledge of God which doesn't lead to prayers is a false knowledge, isn't it? Any theology which doesn't lead to doxology, which is worship, is a worthless teaching. If Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, can bow down before God as he hears the message of judgment, how much more should we bow down before God who gives us the message of his grace, who shows us his love for us at the cross? If Nebuchadnezzar can worship when he hears he's going to be judged, how much more should we worship who know that we're going to be served. The truths of Scripture are given to lead us to humility and heartfelt worship. Now, the second thing you see is Nebuchadnezzar, he submits himself to God's wisdom, doesn't he? He recognizes it's God who tells him the truth about what's going to happen. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He reveals mysteries. Now I want to ask us, do we have the same confidence in God's word? Do we turn to God's word to find out the answer for things? Have we understood what Nebuchadnezzar, the pagan king, understood? That God is the one with all the wisdom. Are we testing everything against his word? Our favorite Bible teachers, our favorite books. Are we like the Bereans who test everything? Because God has given us his word. And the right response to these things is to praise him, is to look to him, is to seek him for his wisdom. If Nebuchadnezzar the pagan king could do it, how much more can we do it as God's children? There's one more thing I want us to see in the passage. Nebuchadnezzar was also thankful to God's people, wasn't he? He paid homage to Daniel, he paid homage to Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He wanted to surround himself with good people. Now, it didn't seem to do him too much good. He doesn't seem to have truly repented at this point. He still goes off on one. He still sins terribly against God's people. But in this moment, he has a flash of wisdom and he thinks, I need to be around good people. I need to have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego near me because they know the God of heaven and they can tell me about the God of heaven. And brothers and sisters, God's given us one another, hasn't he? He's given us one another. I want to surround myself with good people. People who love the Lord Jesus Christ who are going the same direction as I am. And I'm sure you want the same thing for yourself. If, if Nebuchadnezzar the pagan king can see the need for Christian fellowship and he's not even a Christian, how much more should we see the need of it as God's people? He's putting us to shame, this pagan king, isn't he? He's trusting God, he's worshipping God, he wants to meet with God's people. He's doing better than most Christians are. And yet I would submit to you as we'll go through the book that he didn't even know God. He wasn't even saved. Now, just like Christian and in the Pilgrim's Progress, he needed faithful and he needed hopeful to help him on his journey. We need one another a lot more than we realise. Let me just ask us a few questions as we close this evening. Well, this evening we've come face to face with the God who reveals mysteries, the God who rules over the kingdoms of men, the God who is building a kingdom which shall never ever pass away. If we're Christians here tonight, oh, it's such good news this passage, isn't it? The kingdoms of men are all doomed to fail. Babylon is fallen, but Christ is building his kingdom. 
His kingdom will be great, and I would submit to you his kingdom already is great. It's true that in New Zealand and England and in the Western world, the church is declining. But don't believe the lie that God stopped building his kingdom. In Iran, in China, in some of these other lands, there are millions and millions of new believers. He is building his church. He is ruling and reigning now. So let's be taken in by the vision of Scripture. God's kingdom will be a success. It will be a success. Now, it is true there's a final rebellion, there's a man of sin, there's an antichrist, there's a final battle, but that's just a little sliver at the end. Before that, Christ will reign from sea to sea. The nations will worship him. The, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth, it says, as the waters cover the sea. But don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. Check these things for yourself. Check that what I tell you is true because I'm just a man and I could be wrong. Test everything against the word of God and see if these things are so. Well, whatever you believe about the specifics, it's an amazingly positive vision, isn't it? Jesus is the winner. He is the king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He's the rock which smashes the idols of this world to pieces and he'll bring all his people into a wonderful new kingdom. So let me ask you, are you guys, am I living in this reality? Are we seeing the kingdoms of this world as a sinking ship? And if we see this world as a sinking ship, are we on the lifeboat trying to rescue others? Are we out there trying to plead with sinners to be saved? There's still a people to be won for Christ. There's still a church to be built. There's still a people to be reconciled to God. Are you like, are you like Daniel? Are you seeking to live for the kingdom of God? Or are you like Nebuchadnezzar, seeking to live for the kingdoms of man? for the kingdoms which will be destroyed. I trust that God will give us all the wisdom to follow the Christ, the one who is the rock cut without human hands. Amen.